Greetings and welcome to the latest IMCCA webcast uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm your host, David Danto. Um, we have uh, um, a number of people here. We're going to talk about the concept of video fatigue. We're starting to see video fatigue, or the colloquial now is Zoom has jumped into everybody's language, Zoom fatigue. People stuck at home on meetings all the time, and there's an issue around whether or not it's starting to become overtiring or, or, or difficult to do. And I have some great guests on the call with me right now. This one is uh, being sponsored and supported by my colleagues at Polly. Let me let them introduce themselves in the order that I have listed here, starting with Brian. Why don't you uh, tell everybody who you are and what you do? Sure. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm Brian Hellard, and I'm a researcher with Wayne House, and my focus on is evaluating products and services in uh, the unified communications field. Thank you very much, Brian. Ira, you're next on my list. Why don't you tell everybody again who you are, what you do? Great, thank you. This is Ira Weinstein. I'm with Recon Research, and we are a research advisory firm focused on conferencing and collab, and I've been doing this for over 30 years now. Thank you. Terrific. Yeah, we've got about a century of experience on this call if you add everybody up, which is really scary. Um, Sam, you're next on the list. Why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, thanks, David. Uh, so my name is Sam Kennedy. I am the Chief Product Evangelist for Poly. Um, so I spend most of my time out in front of our key customers and partners talking about our technology roadmap uh, to over 20 years in the industry. And actually tomorrow I'll be 15 years at uh, polycom slash poly. Congratulations for that. And rounding our conversation out today, we have somebody who hasn't joined us before, who's going to uh, kind of put our tech geeks in our place and talk a little bit more about the physical space. And Vivian, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everybody who you are and what you do, what your firm does. Hey, I'm Vivian Fleischer. I'm the president and co-founder of Performance-Based Ergonomics. And my role, uh, I've been doing this for about 25 years, but especially during COVID-19, is to really advise you how to stay safe, stay comfortable. And I think today's topic is very, very timely and appropriate. And we're hearing a lot of complaints about eye fatigue, headaches, Zoom fatigue, like you're calling it. So I'm excited for today's talk. Terrific. All right. So uh, let's talk about it first in terms of the reality. I don't think anybody in the world expected to be here, even as we started to hear about, you know, the pen, at least in the Western world, we started to hear about the pandemic uh, taking place in China and starting to hit Europe. You know, we, we were still out. We were still doing things. Nobody expected that we would get the order within three or four days that everybody needs to stay home for like ever. You know, and we know there's no end time. If, if we knew we were going to be here for three, four, five months, you know, whatever it is, we would put up with it. We would know we'd be crossing off the dates. But nobody really has an end date on this. And that in situation in, in and of itself is a stressor, I assume. I mean, guys, what are you hearing from people in, in terms of how just, just being thrown into the situation? Again, not us, because most of us have been doing this video stuff for years and we're very comfortable with it. But most people don't do that. How, what have you been hearing from new users? Well, I, if, I, if I could jump in, um, what we're hearing more than anything is that, that they said it feels like whiplash, right? One minute I'm in one world in my office and I'm, uh, you know, having one setup, one existence. And then, like you said, overnight for some people it was three, four days, but unexpectedly we're now working at home. And for so many people, they were, they're not prepared for this. Right. So that's a big factor into this fatigue and stress, because like you said, if you're a veteran at this and you have a home office set up, there's the, uh, uh, all the stressors associated with, with the pandemic and whatnot. But for those who really were not prepared and then have other household members that they're contending with and just trying to figure out where to do my calls, where to do my video. I have people doing it in the shower, in their car, you know, in the closets, no joke, just to get the privacy factor. Right. So these are real considerations um, and, and a big part of this unexpected piece of it. So, David, if I can jump in, um, companies were caught completely unaware. Nobody thought to prepare for this. I mean, everybody's business continuity plans were around send our people to this other facility. Nobody thought about the idea of there are no facilities and our people cannot go to an office somewhere. Um, so nobody was ready from the corporate level. And then that pushes out to the people, to the workers, who frankly are expected to contribute, expected to work, need to work to earn a living, but they may not have the right tools, the right experience, the, the right uh, the ability to do so in their home or in their apartment or whatever. So everybody's been kind of thrown into the deep end here and people are trying to make do. And I think that's created a lot of stress for a lot of people who want to contribute, but they don't feel they know how or have the ability to do it at this moment. And Sam, I'll, I'll ask you, because I think you're probably in the same boat that I was in that, you know, our jobs 
my time. You know, you hear a lot of people staying at home and petting the dog and being bored and things to do. I am busier than I have ever been in my entire life because a third of my time is spent on what I'm doing professionally. And a third of my time is what I'm spent doing with the industry association. And a third of my time are answering calls from people who say they know I'm an expert in this. How do I do this? How do I do a webcast with 12,000 people? And how do I set up my camera so that my sound is good? And are you getting those kind of calls, Sam? Um, I, I, I'm with you. I'm as busy as I've ever been. Customers are uh, absolutely trying to figure out what exactly do they do. And, and what I'm tending to see is a lot of customers move up their plans. They were they had a, a strategy for rolling out video, for rolling out headsets. And for a lot of, especially on the larger organizations where I spend a lot of my time, and they're moving things up. What, what do I do now? What do I do? Um, what am I going to do in the next six months? Um, they're looking at uh, how, how do I um, uh, how do I live in this new world where a large percentage of my users are going to be working from home for a foreseeable future. Not just if this isn't just here and two months everything's back to normal. It's this is the new normal. And so how do I manage this moving forward? And that's that's been a big part of the the discussions I've been having. Yeah, and we never anticipated the, the concept of everybody flushing test is like I used to call it. Yes, everybody has a, a work from home strategy or most people had a partial work from home strategy. Most firms did, but nobody said everybody go home and work at the same time while your wife is upstairs doing, you know, training for toddlers while your kids are on video games and taking their college classes. You know, we're stressing this, you know, the, the, the technology as far as we ever have. Um, Brian, what are your thoughts about that? Well, what I've found is that there are people that now have to use video that have never even thought about it for their business before. And one case is with my wife, who's a veterinarian, they had an order where clients couldn't come in the door. So we had to quickly hop on, you know, how do we fix this? Uh, we do curbside appointments. And then I said, well, what about telehealth? We can, we can now do video calls with patient or with clients and, and it, my wife can see the pet and still have a good appointment, but the client doesn't actually have to walk in the door. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people being creative with the technology to the extent that the technology can. And I guess, Vivian, you were saying before we started talking that you that there weren't really any guidelines to follow, right? Well, yeah. So, you know, the, the work from home uh, policies from a corporate level when it comes to ergonomics and safety and, and what is the company actually responsible for has been a gray zone for a long time, long before COVID-19 hit us, right? And OSHA, uh, you know, Occupational Safety Health Administration, and Cal OSHA in particular that in California that has a very aggressive ergonomics policy and things that, that companies have to be accountable for, um, you know, like 30 years ago, for, for a short duration, there was provisions for home workers in the US. And then that provision, that requirement went away. So, you know, companies are also at a loss to say, what are we responsible for? We want to do the best by our, our uh, employees. And you had said something earlier, there's no end date. You know, so there's also a budgetary reality. And just to furnish people, is it for three weeks, eight weeks, 10 months? You know, we, we don't know. So there's been a lot of confusion. And when you said, you know, you're fielding a lot of phone calls, so are we, <laughs> right? Um, and I also feel busier than ever before for the same reasons. And so there's, there's, you know, I think slowly but surely this is unscripted, but, you know, people are creating policies just for what they feel is best practice for themselves and what they're able to do. But it, it's a real it's a real thing. Well, to, if I can take that a little bit further, right, um, work from home, you know, has literally been telework, telecommuting. And the reality is, while a lot of companies have allowed their workers to telecommute, most of the companies I've spoken to allow that for special situations, special you know, workers with special skills, location challenges. It's sort of been the exception to the exception, but we'll tolerate it, right? They have never really created a strategy that says, we believe working from home is a cost-effective, efficient way to do our business and serve our clients and our shareholders well. That's a very different animal than, sure, a couple of people work from home a couple of days a week. And, and I think now we're in this situation where we didn't have these plans, but our people are home. And what we're starting to see, and, and I think this is fantastic, if there is a positive side to COVID, and there are very few of them, one of them is that the hypothesis has been proven, that we can actually have 
productive workers working from home, maybe not everyone, but now we've got this situation where that question we've all had about does it make sense to have people at home has been answered. The answer is yes, it does. And that's a big deal. So if there's a silver lining here, that's one of them. But work from home to me has never really existed on mass before. And now it does. Yeah, and Ira, the, the, you have folks like you and I and a few others in the industry that have been talking about how good this concept of remote working is. Just put it on my calendar and I'll take the call from wherever I am, in, out, home, office, traveling. Um, and, and there have been tons of publications, primarily the business publications, poo-pooing that, saying, oh, that'll never work. It's terrible. It's this, it's that. And now those same publications are printing articles with advice on how great it is. So, you know, we've definitely seen the tide turn. Um, and we've now we're here all together, you know, the, the five of us talking about how can we get rid of some of this fatigue? How can we get rid of some of the stress? Because, you know, again, just like we were saying that it's a model that works, we're saying that it's a model that can be without stress. It doesn't have to bother you. And, you know, we can talk about planning. We can talk about technology. We can talk about ergonomics. Why don't we start it in that kind of order? Um, um, planning. You know, I do have to occasionally be on back to back to back calls. And Ira, you're you're intimately aware of the fact that this week, I, for the first time in my life, I was on two Zoom calls at the same time. Um, sometimes you just can't avoid doing that and you have to deal with it. And it's not a perfect circumstance to be on back to back to back calls. The, the simple thing to do is space out your meetings just because you're not in an office doesn't mean that you can't tell whoever's scheduling with you, I'm sorry, I need 10, 15 minute breaks. I, one of the things I do is calendar. I calendar my tasks so that if I know that I've got to write a report, that goes on my calendar. Nobody's going to book me for a meeting at that time and space it out. So, so I'll ask everybody, you know, uh, just the concept of spacing meetings and getting away from your desk and getting in a healthy walk. Is, is that a practice that you guys recommend and any suggestions around it? Good, Brian. Uh, one thing that it was a really good idea is to have 45 minute meetings or at least schedule them for 45 minutes because every time I'm in an hour long meeting that's scheduled, it goes five minutes over and it's just that goes into the next meeting and then the next meeting goes over. And so with a 45 minute meeting, if it does happen to end in 45 minutes, you get 15 minutes uh, to do whatever, take a break, take your eyes off the screen before the next meeting starts. Well, Agreed. I, I, I'd love to jump in right there because there is a, a something that you may not be aware of, but our blink rate goes drastically down when we're staring at a screen. And most of us on average blink 30 to 50 percent less when staring at a screen. And that is really um, a big cause of eye fatigue, irritation, headaches, whatnot. So this notion of 45 minute meetings, even 30 minute meetings. It's amazing what can happen, you know, when you're focused and targeted with a good agenda. And taking that break in between is so important, not just mentally, physically to stand up, stretch, get yourself in another position. And then for your eyes, just to get that focal length different than just being screen length away. Look, you know, go to look out the window, look across the room, close your eyes for a second. And that really, really is, is critical to be able to endure a day's worth of meetings on and off throughout the day. So just if I can chime in for a moment, I mean, I've been doing many hours of video meetings for over a decade now. Some days I have nine, 10 hours of video meetings. I try to avoid that, but there's a couple of rules we follow. Num number one, we only make certain blocks of time available for, for meetings in general. We block other periods for work, but we block maybe three or four hours a day for meetings, and we try to stick to that. And that ensures that we're not sitting at the desk, staring at the screen intensely for more than a couple of hours. Second thing we do is we try to alternate intensity of meeting. One meeting may be a quick chatter update. The next might be a strategy session. The next might be a presentation. Then the next is a touch base. So we, we lighten the mood in between so it's not so intense. Um, and then we always do what we can to keep a few minutes in between the meeting just to breathe, to get up to walk, to, to grab a drink or a cup of coffee, just to keep our eyes on other things and to keep us from getting too focused. We combine all that, and we've been doing that for a long time, and without that, the stress level goes too high. So I think everybody's experiencing this stress, and I think we do need to work together on this kind of thing. All right, that's great advice. And, and an interesting thing, if you know, as, as a lot of us are students of this industry for a long time, we had that phenomenon from around 2006, 
for, I don't know, about five, six, seven years of immersive telepresence. Sam, you, you and I know we were deeply involved in a lot of all of that stuff. And, and one of the benefits of immersive telepresence, granted with all the downsides of expense and gouging and tying up rooms and all the rest of the things that we've now realized were not smart, but it was smart to be able to be in a long form meeting with people that are roughly life size that are roughly the same size as they would be if they were in the room with you because that also takes stress off because your mind is not interpreting that there are these tiny people that are real in real life you're seeing them at pretty much a normal perspective what was your experience of those rpx rooms and some of those other things that we used to work with oh. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that in the in the polycom solutions uh, that you could stand up and walk around and 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 that they were the life size they were they were they appeared to be just as if you were in the same room and giving that giving that perception that people are in the same room with you it does does fool your mind and therefore i can go longer and we spent a lot of time on the audio for those rooms and having this life-like audio experience so it did feel that um that everybody it, it, the, the more you feel and the more you fool your brain that you're in the same room with someone the longer you can go and so uh, absolutely we were given those experiences and, and we would have customers that would be in those rooms for days at a time and they would just tell us they felt completely comfortable in those types of rooms. Yeah, I, I've had that experience as well, where if I had to sit in a typical video conference room, even with a 65 inch screen at the end and be in a meeting, you know, those meetings take an hour, an hour and a half, your brain is going crazy. You need a break, not just a bio break. You just, you can't handle it. It gets very stressful. But when we're in those life-size rooms, you know, we could be in for all day strategy sessions with appropriate bio breaks and meals and whatever, and you didn't have the same stress. So part of it is just seeing people bigger. Um, and that's definitely one of the things I want to talk about. Let's transition this over to some technology suggestions that we want to go over. Some of these technology suggestions, you know, I, I uh, equate this to the conversation that everybody's having right now with wearing masks. Some of them are not like wearing masks. Some of them you're doing to protect yourself. Some of them are like wearing masks you're doing to help everybody else that's going through the situation right now. So, I mean, I, let's, let's start with the simple one. Um, everybody's looking at what we call in the industry continuous presence uh, nowadays. You know, you even see it being faked on TV shows, and I've talked about this and a couple of other websites, uh, uh, webcasts, where, you know, it's the Brady Bunch, Hollywood Squares, you're seeing 50 people on the screen at the same time, and everybody's toasting, you know, and you're doing your happy hour. And that is the worst experience of video conferencing that we've ever had in our industry. And everybody's kind of admitted that. A little postage stamp size view doesn't work. Now, it's great for a teacher that needs to see her whole class or somebody giving a lecture, but if you're looking at somebody like me right now talking, you want to see me as big as possible. Most video conferencing platforms give you the ability to do that. They give you the ability to switch the view to what's called voice switched, full presenter mode, make the other person at the other end as big as possible. Um, and I'm sure there are a bunch of other technical recommendations. I'll let you guys chime in. Who, who's, got a, who's got more suggestions they want to throw in? So David, let me let me jump in on this one here. It's interesting. We, we've talked to a number of our large clients and we've asked them what their users prefer. We've surveyed those users and we find that it's a mixed discussion. Some people actually prefer multiple people on screen at once. It gives them a greater feeling of connectedness. They feel like they're in touch with more people. Other people feel like you were saying, which is I want a full screen view of the person. Now, I have to say personally, I think a large continuous presence view with a lot of people on screen at once is unnatural. If I was sitting in a meeting room, it's unlikely that at the same time, my eyes would be looking at 16 people at once, watching all these people moving and fidgeting. So I'm a fan of the continuous presence concept, you know, the, the Hollywood squares, as long as it's limited, you know, I want to see two, three, four people. And as long as everybody has an adequate size on the screen, so I'm not staring at a tiny postage stamp. So it, it's, you know, it's definitely a personal choice. I think it's an equipment choice, but, but I think people need to minimize this distraction factor and continuous presence is a great way to be distracted. Yeah, maybe if I could touch on, uh, again, one of the things that I think has been adding to the stress is that there's a lot of tool, new tools that people may not have been using every day. And there's a lot of capabilities in, in all of the major clients out there, if it's, if it's uh, Teams or WebEx or Zoom or BlueJeans. And, and I think that initially 
that people weren't really comfortable in, in playing with the tools and understanding what abilities are there, what abilities are not there. And we heard a lot of security issues where it was if you just put a passcode, you didn't have any security issues. And so I, I, I'm with Ira. I think that um, it, it is somewhat of a personal choice and somewhat of the meeting type. Do I want continuous presence or voice switching? I particularly, as a user, I love continuous presence because it, it fools my brain into being more like we're all in the same room. I want to see the body language of everyone. I want to know that if I'm, talk, if I'm talking and I can tell that someone else wants to jump in, I'm going to stop. And so to me, I, I particularly like continuous presence. It feels more natural. But again, the ability, any of these major clients out there, they have a lot of these capabilities all built in. So users just shouldn't be afraid to play around and try different things because I think a lot of the things are there. You just have to kind of dig and look around. So for me, it's it's more about how I can get my eyes off the screen. And when I see a gallery full of people, I'm just looking at, trying to look at everybody at once. And it and everybody's a little postage stamp, and it, and it just creates more eye strain. So I try to do anything you know possible to look away from the screen, just like I would be in a normal meeting. So normally, you know, I have two displays here and I have the ability to take notes and see full screen of video. I tend to take notes by hand just so I can get my eyes off the screen, take my notes, and then later, of course, I have to port it into Word and, and share it with everybody. But just anything I can do to keep my eyes off the screen helps when you're in meetings all day long. Oh yeah, I, I, I want to comment on that too. You know, in the in the ergo world, there's something called the 2020-20 um, rule, if you will. So in normal times, when you're just looking at your screen to do a uh, report or emails or whatever, the idea is every 20 minutes, look away from your screen for 20 seconds, and you want to have your focal distance be at least 20 feet away from, from you. And that really goes a long way in protecting your eyes. So what I find is that when you do have a continuous presence, as you were just saying, Brian, your eyes are skidding all over the screen, right? You're looking up, you're looking down. So your eyes are gonna get more fatigued more quickly, right? So, you know, something that we've adopted here at PBE, because we do a lot, we're, we're a virtual company, by the way. So when we're not on site with clients, we've been working at home for the last 20 years for, for those of us who work at, at PBE. So when we do internal meetings, especially now, we start the meeting with continuous presence so we can all say hello and have that sort of group feel and feel connected to each other. And then we kind of, uh, we, we, we uh, encourage just to let yourself go down to just one person speaking so you're seeing just one headshot, not 20. Um, and then ending the meeting that way as well. So that's been a, a nice technique that's worked for us as well. So see everybody together as a group for the beginning, see everybody at the end, but in between you give yourself relief, your eyes get to go off the screen, and um, I think that, that that's been helping a lot. That's some great advice and good points from all of you. For, for me, from my perspective, I think, and you know, I don't, I don't want to sound elitist in any of this stuff, but because people, a lot of people are using just what they have and they didn't really have a choice. But if you really want the strain to go away, you obviously need a bigger display in front of you. The larger the display, the larger that people will be on it, no matter what layout you choose. And in many cases, you use an external higher quality camera so that you're able to put it where you want and, and better lighting. And I've done this demonstration before. I don't know if I'm going to bother doing it right now, but you know, the lighting and the sound pieces that I'm using um, are not necessarily making my life easier. Um, I'd ra much rather be speaking, you know, just with the built-in embedded speaker and microphone. I wouldn't have to wear a headset. Well, I'm glad nowadays it's clamping down my overgrown hair. Uh, but, but that's something that we do for the other people. If my lighting is better, if my camera is better, if my sound is better because it's being picked up by a microphone uh, near my voice, the other people on the call are going to strain less seeing me and hearing me, and that's going to improve it. That goes back to that mask analogy. You're doing it for the other people, not for yourself. So, you know, I, you know, Ira, you've probably got the nicest looking shot of all of us on this thing right now. I, I can tell you're using a virtual background, but I, you must have a specific lighting on you at this point. Point. So great point, David. And the, the answer is I do, but I, I work hard to balance the lighting in terms of how it affects me and the experience that I give to others. And, and I have the benefit of being able to do that. And I've invested time and money in doing it. But I, I'm very cautious to not have lights blasting in my eyes. I'm very cautious to control sunlight blasting on the side of my face. Right. It's a compromise. And I, I like to tell people that you should pick that that place you want to be. It's a knob. To the left means it's great for me to work in here, but the other side can't see me. To the right means 
the other side has a perfect view, but I'm blinded. You have to pick somewhere in the middle and come up with an acceptable experience. But I'm, I'm very big on protecting yourself first and giving yourself a, a work environment that's going to allow you to work productively and safely for the day. And if you need to tweak a little bit here and there to make the far end experience work. And, and that's what I did here. And I can tell you, it's a tiny bit darker than I would like in my office. But if I added more light, it gets too bright for the far end. So that's my tiny compromise. And that's what I suggest to people. Sam, you were going to say? Yeah, one thing that uh, I think is important is uh, being in the video industry for over 20 years, still the most important part of any meeting is audio. Uh, audio is, is critical. I think people can even suffer a little bit if your video quality isn't there, um, but audio is, is absolutely, you really want to have a high-end audio experience. Now, again, I think I'm the only one on here not wearing a headset. Uh, so for me as a user, because I'm on meetings all day long, I actually, I have an extra, I have a little puck um, that, that I particularly use because it's just more comfortable for me as a user. Um, but then some meetings I will get and, and wear a headset, so I kind of switch it throughout the day. But you know, having a high-quality audio device really, I think, gives a great experience for the people that you're talking to, but also helps you if you don't have – Good speakers. If you're just using the speakers on your laptop, you're going to be sitting there struggling all day, and that's going to add to that fatigue. But to me, audio is is just the most critical part in order to to, to have successful meetings, but also help with that fatigue. Um, Sam, I'd love to jump in here because something I'm experiencing personally, and I know that a lot of our clients are too. You can see these big headphones on my ear. Um, I was using my earbuds my good old earbuds, and I started getting ringing in my ears. I got ear fatigue. That could be a whole nother webinar topic, right? <laughs> but, um, but the ear fatigue is real. So it's, it's the audio for the others that are, we're having our video meetings with, absolutely. So they're not straining, but our own experience, right? So you know, when we're not hearing, we're gonna lean in closer. But having headphones when I have hefty days of meetings are really can be, become bothersome. So I switched to over-the-ear headphones with noise-canceling features that helps me. I hopefully helps drown out sometimes my, my household, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm just curious, Sam, you, you have an external speaker? What, what are you using? Because I'd love to pass that on to folks. Uh, well, I'm using the uh, Callisto 7200. So uh, you, we make a number of different types of uh, devices. And so for all different price points, all different quality, um, that's what I love. For me, that's what I almost use uh, exclusively. Uh, again, I do use headsets sometimes, but there's just lots of um, – uh, uh, it's just, again, I don't have that fatigue on my ears mm -hmm. that I do. But, again, it depends on the meeting and, type, depends on the uh, personal level. And, and, Sam, Vivian, that's actually a really good point. One of the things that I do with Polly is I'm in charge of – it's really funny. I'm in charge of our customer advisory board now, which is something I was on the charter customer advisory board when it came out as a customer. So, you know, interesting history there. Um, one of the things that we all fight about, and these are brilliant – enterprise leaders and managers and technologists if the subject of headsets and audio comes up everybody thinks everybody else is wrong and that's one of the reasons that poly and other companies make so many different kinds of headsets because i'm wearing a one ear over the head wired headset right now because that's the best one for me for recording but we have two ears we have noise canceling we have bluetooth we have you know the the speaker microphones the 7200 the the 52 the 5300 everybody's going to swear that what they like the best is the only right way to go about doing it so just about the only thing that we can suggest if we wanted to give generic and non-branded advice here is don't settle for the earbuds that you happen to have around don't settle for the speaker that's in your pc or in your device figure out what works for you experiment a little bit and and then you'll find something that makes it much less stressful and much more comfortable for you so david if i can jump in um I like to tell people that video is sexy, but audio is what matters. I mean, if you're going to have a good meeting, the audio needs to be clean. And I will, I will from time to time tell people, I'll say, look, your audio is so bad. Can, can you please dial in or use some other device? Because I can't listen to a 45 minute meeting with this audio or it's too distracting for me. I do expect people to have reasonable audio. Now, the good news is, and this is important, you don't have to spend a lot to get good audio. That, that's what amazes me. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we completed a testing of 56 USB audio systems that you could use personally or in a small meeting room, not five, 56. And you know what we determined? With almost no exception, every one of these devices would work beautifully 
for somebody working at home. And by the way, they're priced from $75 up to three or $400. So this is not a break the bank discussion. You do not have to buy the most expensive thing. You buy what works for you, spend what you can, and that's gonna be a massive improvement. And it's important, not just for you, because you'll hear it better, but for the other side, because the microphones will be better and the quality is better. And then you can see here, I'm wearing a headset right now. I'm, I'm wearing, um, I have to be using a poly headset at this moment. And it works for me because the mics are out of the way. It doesn't look you know, severe like I'm wearing big cans or anything, but it works for me and it's cost effective. That's a great example of how to sort of solve that problem. Great. Um I, I want to, if, if we could, just circle back to, uh, for a second, back to the lighting issue, because there's um, a lot to be said about the lighting so that uh, it's going to work for how you look on screen, right, so that others see you, uh, they, they have a better experience. But I also want to remind everybody who's doing the video calls, there's also lighting issues for, for you, right? Um, and that is to be cognizant that screens, any of our screens, emit something called blue light. And blue light can uh, actually irritate the eyes and, and be um, injurious to us. So, you know, there are blue light filters that you can download for your screen to protect you. Um, and then there's also blue light uh, filters on, you can get in your glasses or specific glasses on Amazon. They're like 15 bucks um, of what's literally called blue light glasses. So if you're in front of the screen more than before, especially for video calls, that's another piece of it. So you want to be just kind of fiddle with your own contrast levels on your screen. So what you're looking at. And then, you know, see if, if you can get something to protect you from the blue light. And Vivian, I'll let you keep talking about that, but I will just give you a specific example. These are my computer glasses. They're meant for about 14 to 18 inches. So that's the way I have prescription set. Yeah. These are my old computer glasses. And if you can see, all of a sudden now you see the three or four screens that I'm looking at reflected yeah. in because I didn't have the filters put on them. These, I spent the extra money and put the filters on. And while you still see the lights, you don't see that blue. I'm not seeing it and you're not seeing it reflected back to you. It's a great point. That's a real, and the computer glasses is a great point, right? So, you know, if you are a glasses wearer, um, I, just be, uh, the computer glasses itself are made specifically to help you negotiate the distance between you and the computer, you and the keyboard for near distance so that you don't have to um, fatigue your eyes and your head and your neck even more than it might be happening. So I just wanted to circle back to the, uh, to the headsets. What, I, what I've found out is that if I use just a normal microphone setup, I live on a very highly trafficked road. And if I'm using active speaker, I've found that when a large truck drives by and I'm not speaking, it'll put me active speaker front and center when someone else is trying to speak. So I, I try to keep uh, using a headset uh, as much as possible. That's a good point. And, you know, we're all pretty good at this right now because we've been doing it on this call. We're muting ourselves when we're not talking so that, you know, we don't accidentally get picked up by the switching. So that works really well. Sam, you had one other point you wanted to make? Yeah, one other uh, maybe tip uh, for, for people who don't do this every single day is uh, um, if you're starting to have some network issues, tur turn your camera off. Uh, what we find is for a lot of users where they're starting to have some quality issues, where the network's having some issues and people can't understand you, turn your video off. It may just be enough to, to stop uh, the, the quality issues and people can then hear you, right? The systems are intelligent enough to, to, to s slow everything down and just send the audio um, to everyone on the call and it could clean up a lot of experiences. This is something that, some, doing this every day for years is one of those things we found. So just to kind of a tip is, if you're having some quality issues, turn your camera off, you might see a pretty good improvement. Yeah, especially nowadays that people are all sequestered at home together and they're all, you know, everybody's pounding in the internet at the same time. So so let's take ourselves to our last category that we had talked about, which is the concept of ergonomics. Um, I am hardly the expert in this because I break a lot of things, but I will preface it by saying that I've done a number of things in my environment to make it more comfortable for me personally that, that I think are interesting. First of all, I don't know if you could, you know, there's no way that you could possibly tell. I'm working in my basement office. People have seen this view behind me and Pac-Man and everything for years and, um, <clears throat> and Underdog's been with me for forever. But um, one of the things I have is all the lighting in this basement is set to daylight color temperature. 
it makes it more comfortable for me to not have the strain I have of either fluorescent lighting or the warm lighting. The cool daylight temperature makes me feel a lot more comfortable that I'm in an outdoor environment that I'm outside. The other thing that I did just recently, and I wrote a whole blog about it. I'll see if I can put the, the text up so you can find it. I took one of my old iPads and I mounted it on a little arm right in front of me. And I've got a camera posted in my house's front window. I have no windows here in the basement, so I have no idea what's going on outside. <clears throat> if it's day or night, I didn't know what hours I was working. Now I can see when the mail is coming and when we're getting deliveries. I can see that it's raining outside today. I can see my, my family's car so that I know that people are home. It's made a tremendous difference just to have that little glance, to be able to see that there's something else going on in the world because I didn't have it in a window where I was in my office space. So I know these are just some tips. Let me go to you. What, what are the you know top two, top three basics of about setting up a working environment so that you don't have eye strain and neck strain and things are where they're supposed to be for the human body and the, the architecture of how we are. And first of all, I just want to thank you for that uh, reminder for a lot of us who work uh, in a space without windows. That's a really brilliant solution you came up with, right? To just have a glimpse into the outside world and go, aha, okay, I'm not going to get totally lost in my, in my work world. So uh, that's good. But I would say, um, it, let's start first related just to, to video calls and screens in general, right? Because I'd say in the ergo equation, if we want to maintain what we call an upright and balanced posture, and this is where the head is nicely balanced over the neck, over the shoulders, you have a nice plumb line from your ear to your shoulder, to your elbow, to your hip if you're sitting. And obviously if you're standing, that plumb line continues, right? Um, but I would say the eyes are king in determining where the rest of your head, neck, and back are gonna go. So we want that line of vision to really be at about eye level or slightly below. And this is really, really important because if my, eye, if my monitor's too high, look where my head's gonna go because I'm looking up. If it's off to the side, I'm turning. If it's down low, which is so many of us are doing, and we're doing our video calls on our laptop screens, on our tablets, on our phones, um, you know, some of us have the external monitor set up, but for so many to go kind of go full circle, when we started this discussion, people came, they were thrust into this home environment. And today, five, six weeks later, we're still hearing, I have a laptop, I don't have my external keyboard and mouse, I'm not set up for that. So what happens when we're low, which is probably the biggest trigger for poor posture, is that head and neck is gonna crane forward. I'm coming out of the camera now. And I see a lot of calls with people like this, by the way, right? So when we do virtual evaluations and we're one-on-one -on -one and I see the top of somebody's head like this, that's a really good sign that they're posturally, if they're out of whack. So you really wanna prop up your screen so that your eyes are probably looking at the top third of the screen, right? And just like when you read something, it's slightly below the face. Uh, computer glasses are great for that, but if you happen to be a progressive glasses or bifocal wearer, you're gonna be looking out of the bottom part of your glasses. So the exception is to those folks where you're actually going to want the screen lower. And I think one of the best things to do is place your screen and just monitor your posture. If you're well aligned and comfortable, you're probably gonna go a good spot, right? So you want that screen eye level, you want it directly in front of you so you don't have to torque and turn. Um, and then for a chair, ideally we're gonna have a chair that's gonna have adequate back support so that if you wanna lean back, I wanna be comfortable. Um, we were talking before we started recording about that people have gotten very formal in, in these meetings, right? And we're gonna kind of sit up a little bit artificially. So we want to sit up well, we wanna be looking forward, but we also want to be relaxed, right? Because if I'm gonna sit and kind of sit up straight for the next 45 minutes, my back's gonna hurt at the end. We don't want that. Right, so we want an upright, comfortable, something that's gonna support you behind you, right? So that you're not slumping, slouching, um, low riding in your chair, et cetera. And then um, just a, a one thing I'll throw out there just for uh, on video calls, but certainly off video calls when we have to start typing, you just wanna place your keyboard and mouse within close reach at about elbow level, right? And so the idea is let's honor the natural alignments of our body. And if we find ourselves reaching, torquing, twisting, and then hopefully, we don't get to the point of hurting, but you just wanna play detective and say, hey, what's going off the mark? And then you get creative in how you can get those screens up. Boxes, books are a great solution <laughs> if needed, right? Um, so, you know, these, I would say those are the three most important things. So this is Ira, if I can jump in for a minute. Um, everything you said, I agree with. I mean, I am very specific about my chair. I'm very specific about you know, where I'm sitting in the room, I like to have natural light if I can. I've got a window there. 
Um, I use a very specific type of mouse and keyboard that's comfortable for me. But I, when it comes to my displays, I have three displays and I have them all in a stand. So they're all at the proper height. But more than that, I have defined things I do on each display to keep me from looking off axis too often. So I live and breathe on my main display and I have my reference information on my other displays that I look there quickly and then I get right back to my main display. And if I'm gonna look at something for more than a minute, I'll move it right into home base in my center so that I'm comfortable and not turning or, or torquing myself to do it. I think that's a big deal. And, and I've been doing that for years. And before I did that, I had all sorts of neck pain and strain during work. And now I don't have that. And if I see myself turning, I will consciously try to fix that. that that's a big one. And then I wanna chime in or I wanna support what you said about being relaxed, right? We still find, especially people that are relatively new to video meetings, is that there's a certain implied formality. When you're in a video meeting, you, you sit up straight, you fold your hands in front of you, you look straight ahead and you don't turn. Well, in a meeting room, that's not how we act. So we need to, to remind ourselves that even though we're on camera in our home office or whatever, it's still a meeting. Sit back, relax a little, you're talking to people, and yes, you're on camera, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be yourself. And what you'll find is the moment you sit back a little and unwind, a lot of that stress goes down, you feel more comfortable, because the goal here is to contribute to the experience. The goal here is not to capture you like you're a news broadcaster. So, so that's something that we remind our clients of all the time. And if people are too formal in a meeting, I will suggest to them, I'll say, hey guys, relax a little. We're all friends. Let's just have our chat. That's that's terrific advice to avoid the stress. And also, you know, we were talking before about how this isn't, um, um, we're not on broadcast TV. It's no big deal. The the fact that we get interrupted by our pets or our children or or, or anything else wandering into the frame is actually humanizing this this experience. It, it makes everybody kind of feel a little bit better. Um, I, I will also comment, Ira, on that comment you made about displays. This is where you start to get into the difference between the, the person working at home who got thrust into it and, and doesn't plan on doing it for the rest of their lives versus somebody, people like us who are, who are typically working from home when we're not traveling, which is you're not doing this thing with one laptop or one notebook. Um, you set up your work environment so that it's comfortable for you. Something that, that, you know, I had to show my wife when she was working with people upstairs that she wasn't familiar with because she's not a technologist, is if you're somebody who shares content most of the time, make sure that your computer has a second display and always use that second display for shared content. So you're never showing anybody your email. You're never showing anybody, you know, the things that are private to you. When you want to share something, you're always moving it over to that space, which is the one that's available to share with other people. And you want to have that space. And right now, I've made this joke a million times. I'm staring at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, if I can count my iPhone, eight screens in front of me right now. And each one is serving its purpose. One's got a countdown timer for the show. One has my notes on. On it one has the video on it um uh, and you know some are not on at this moment but they would be if i was using them so so i've now personalized it for me it's another reason i would never go back to an office because i would never get this set up in a publicly used office it would never be personalized for me so those are just you know some of the tricks once you get comfortable with the space and you move things where you like them you'll find that it's a lot more fluid to be able to continue i have to keep reminding myself to stare at the camera instead of stare at the faces not because you know, it's the right thing to do. You can even argue it's the wrong thing to do. But I present remotely to customers and clients so often, I want them to make it look like I'm looking at them like I'm crazy Eddie and selling directly to the camera. So th these are the tricks you get when you start to become pros. Uh, Ira, you want to comment? David, yeah, quick comment on that. There, there's some good things here, right? For $300, not that $300 is nothing, but for $300, you can buy one or two additional displays in a stand. It's not a lot of money. It, it's If you're going to be home for weeks on end, this is a no brainer, in my opinion, just for your own well-being. And then number two, we're seeing a lot of our enterprise clients soften the rules about expense reimbursement for home. And that's a big deal. And that's one of the things we were talking about, about policies coming around. We didn't have those rules in place before, but I'm happy to say we're seeing a lot of companies say a few hundred dollars to set you up is fine. We don't need you to submit the model number and the request and all the details. You are approved for a, for a base expense. And it's just not worth processing all the approvals for a $100, $200 monitor. But yes, you can buy it, you can use it, and please be healthy. 
That's a big well, deal. Ira, that's that's going to be a Pandora's box, and that's a topic for another conversation entirely, which I'm more than happy to have you join, because as we go into whatever this new normal is that everybody's talking about, if people are going to work from home on a continuous basis, because they're going to be expected to, because that's part of the new business continuity plan, either to be working from home or to be able to be working from home, does that mean I need to have enough adequate broadband in my house to support my business activities when my wife is doing her calls and my kids are doing their education and games. And if that's the case, our company is going to reimburse me for having that broadband. It's not something that happens very often. And then if that's the case, are they going to still build an office in a cubicle for me because they're going to be spending for me at home? It's really going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Are you getting that, Ira? Absolutely. And, and the answer is we have to, we have to navigate this you know, as a, as a society. What are the expectations? How much should the users pay for? How much should the companies pay for? But there is a minimum requirement we have in the typical household. And I think it's reasonable. And we're seeing companies that are approving these basic enhancements. Now, I'm not talking about installing, you know, a generator on your house just in case power goes out. Perhaps that's not the company's responsibility. But making sure that you have you know, a second display so you can be comfortable. Absolutely. Those kind of things we're seeing, those are getting approved easily. Yeah, maybe I'm, I'm leaning into that conversation, but I maybe I have a question for, for Vivian is, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm seeing is uh, a number of our internal users having standing desks at home and doing video at standing desk. I mean, any, is that a good thing to do? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm glad you brought it up. So yes, it's a great thing to do. It's, it's not a requirement. It's really a personal preference. But I have a lot of folks who tell, ask me, like, can I do my video call standing? And we say, yes, just adjust your screen accordingly. And if you're going to type, adjust your, your, uh, your, your keyboard and mouse accordingly. But I think the idea that, you know, if you're on, even on calls and you're not on video, right, and you don't, you're not set up for a standing uh, session, that's a fantastic opportunity to get out of that chair, to stand, to just change positions of your body. So um, I, my answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> And now all the desks that I saw at CES over the years that have the hydraulics so that they can rotate between positions and keep you active and moving. Now that starts to make sense. Of course, we need to have room for it. And a lot of people working from home out of studio apartments can't even get a corner of the dining room table to uh, or, or kitchen table to be able to work in. So we're not suggesting any of these challenges are easy, but we're here to give you some advice if you have the ability to try and make this fatigue go away and try and get the most out of collaboration from home. And again, in all honesty, we have between all of us, over a century of doing this and it's not a problem as long as you follow some of these basic rules and hints and guidelines you're going to get a lot out of it and find that you enjoy these meetings more and more often so let me go around to all the people that i've had on this call and ask each one of them um, how people can reach out to them and get in touch with them and let's uh, let's kind of do this in the backwards order that we did it last time so vivian if somebody wanted to talk to you more about this or know more about your company how would they reach out to you oh thank you um it's very easy you would just go to support at pb ergo.com. So it's pbergo.com. So just support at pbergo.com. That'll come to me and happy to ask, uh, answer any questions you might have and discuss uh, whatever topic uh, you need to discuss. Terrific. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Today. And Sam, how would somebody get a hold of you if they wanted to find out more? Sure. Uh, you come to me and look, uh, uh, um, add me on LinkedIn, uh, Sam Kennedy at Poly. Uh, dot com or uh, Twitter SPKV12. So lots of opportunities. Go to your poly sales rep, of course, uh, if you want any of these gear. Sorry for the commercial. That's okay. We're we're all we're all in this together, and we've been as agnostic as we can be. It's just when we're talking about headsets, you know, you have to talk about the best ones on the market. So that was just kind of a given. Um, uh, Ira, how can somebody reach out to you get more information about what you, what you do over at Recon? Sure, very easy. Go to our website. That's reconres.com. You can hit me on LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever, and send me an email. You can do iWeinstein at reconres.com. Happy to talk to you. Thank you very much, Ira. And finally, Brian, how would somebody reach out more to you and get more information from you? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, the easiest way to reach me is uh, via Twitter, at Brian Hellard. Brian, that's terrific. Thanks very much, all four of you, for joining me. I think this is a very helpful webcast um, for the IMCCA and for Polly. I'm David Danto. Until the next one, we're going to keep sending out these webcasts. Uh, um, as long as the information is good and valid and it's not buried in the noise floor of what everybody else is talking about, we're going to keep providing it out to you, and hopefully we'll all get through this together. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.
Thank you.